Hello, I'm Catherine Kajerska from the University of Melbourne and the Doherty Institute in Australia. And today I'm delighted to join uh, and tell you um, about our recent um, studies on T cell immunity in influenza and COVID-19. So um, my laboratory at the University of Melbourne has been interested in understanding immunity to newly emerging um, viruses for over a decade now. And that really started in 2009 when we had an outbreak of the um, swine-derived um, H1N1 influenza. And we knew that at the population level, we had minimal pre-existing antibody immunity. And the question we asked was whether there was any pre-existing um, cross-reactive CD8 cell immunity that could give us some protection. And the answer was yes. And there was a substantial level of cross-reactive CD8 T cell immunity, especially between the um, 2009 influenza and the influenza viruses that circulated early in the century, including the Spanish um, 1918 influenza. Um, similarly, in 2013, when there was a new avian h 7 influenza virus that emerged in China, causing more than 30% mortality rates, uh, we established a really wonderful collaboration with Professor Jensen Xu uh, from the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center. And um, together we um, did the studies um, to understand what immune responses drive recovery from CPE h 7 and um, also what immune perturbations were associated with a fatal immune disease. So to be at the forefront of um, understanding immunity um, to newly emerging infectious diseases, uh, we established a cohort of, uh, in 2014, a cohort um, that we call NTC cohort. And um, in that cohort, we recruit um, we recruit um, patient and concerned patients on hospital admission, patients with influenza-like illness. Uh, we um, obtain blood samples um, during the hospital stay, on discharge, as well as on day 30 follow-up. So prior to 2020, um, usually we um, two-thirds of those patients were flu-infected individuals, whereas the remaining ones uh, were infected with other respiratory um, viruses. Um, so having those samples from acutely infected um, influenza patients allow us to understand in-depth immune responses during human acute influenza, but also uh, compare and contrast uh, to compare and contrast immune responses to influenza virus vaccination and infection. Um, so um, here I'm just summarizing this, uh, a few of our studies. So. Um, what, what, what seems um, apparent is that um, both during influenza vaccination and that's with the inactivated influenza vaccine and influenza infection, um, there is obviously an induction of antibodies as well as antibody secreting cells, uh, which are the short-lived effectors known to produce large amounts of antibodies, as well as uh, follicular to helper cells. And these are the um, T cells that uh, facilitate uh, interactions with B cells in germinal centers and are important for both longevity and high affinity of antibodies. We also see um, responses from C both CD21 low and high uh, B cells. However, looking at um, other cellular immune responses um, during influenza virus infection, we do see robust CD8 T cell made gamma delta and NK cell responses, and that does not happen with the inactivated influenza vaccines. And especially CD8, induction of CD8 T cells is important as CD8 T cells play a major role in controlling virus infection. So CD8 T cells, um, Recognized peptides derived from the virus presented on MHC class one on antigen presenting cells. Following this interaction, they proliferate, kill virally infected cells, uh, produce cytokines, as well as establish long term cross reactive memory groups. So, cross reactivity of C T cells across distinct influenza A um, strains and subtypes has been known for a while, and this is uh, predominantly by um, 
work, uh, PNE work from um, Gus Reynoldson. Uh, however, the question that we ask is, what is really the breadth of this cross-reactive um, CD80 responses? Are there any CD80 responses that can um, cross-react across influenza A, B, and C viruses that um, are capable of infecting humans? Um, so in collaboration with G VJ, what we did, we analyzed all the epitopes in the epitope database across all the influenza A, B, and C sequences um, that we could put our hands on. So here in the inner circle, we're looking at influenza A derived peptides and the conservation against influenza A viruses. And you can see out of, this is out of 100, there is a really great level of conservation of those um, peptides. Uh, 30 peptides were also conserved with influenza B viruses and eight uh, with influenza C. So we've done quite a bit of work in the lab to screen which ones of those peptides gave prominent um, CD80 responses. And uh, we found that especially one, PB1413 peptide, was really um, an exciting um, vaccine target. And that's for two reasons. One, that PB1413 has been conserved amongst all the influenza A, B, C, a, B, and C viruses um, capable of infected humans, all the avian viruses, as well as the pandemic viruses. Moreover, um, this peptide is presented by HLA-A2, which is one of the most common HLA allele um, prominent in 40% of the world uh, global population. So we've been doing those experiments, looking at the conserved um, T cell targets uh, when the virus, uh, the new virus emerged um, at late, in late December 2009. And as you know, the number of cases rose quickly, the virus spread uh, rapidly, and um, straight away uh, we, we became interested in immune responses um, to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So apart from our own DZ cohort, we, we are also a part of CETRAB-ID and that Sentinel Travelers Research Preparedness Platform for Emerging Infectious Diseases. It's been established at the Dorothy Institute in 2018, and it's led by Dr. Irani Tabarajan. It is really an active framework between epidemics and pandemics um, with all the active um, ethical appro ethics approval and so on, that enables broad biological sampling, especially from return travelers coming with new infectious diseases. Um, so Trevor encompasses a broad range of expertise at the Doherty Institute, and my group has been involved in CETRA since its beginning, and that's um, a senior postdoc in the lab, Dr. Wan Nguyen, um, that actually established all the protocols and ethics, um, ethics approvals uh, for the immunology part of CETREP. So our first sample came through CETREP on Saturday, the 1st of February, 2020. Um, and um, here, uh, this was uh, a sample from one of Australia's first patient infected with COVID-19. Uh, we perform immune analysis, um, and we were really fortunate to publish um, those immune analysis as the world first report on immune responses in COVID-19. We continue to recruit patients and um, then um, really delve into immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So in our first case of the mild to moderate immune uh, COVID-19, uh, we looked at immune responses that we knew were important in influenza infection. So firstly, we look at antibody secreting cells and T follicular helper cells that I've mentioned to you previously. So here on day seven, after disease onset, we could see small but really distinct populations of both of those po um, populations. But the exciting um, news were on day eight, when we saw a marked increase in both of those populations. And it was so exciting because we knew from our influenza studies that when we see um, such uh, rapid increase in those two of those populations, the patient usually recovers around day three after, um, after um, 
this time point, and that's exactly what happened in that case. We also look at the activation of CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells by two uh, markers, HLA-DR CD38, and again, you can see around the eight um, really increased um, increase um, activation of both CD8 and CD4 T cells. Um, we looked at the um, at the function by analysis of enzymes and perfrin, the cytolytic molecules, and you can see especially within the activated CD38 HLA-DR, CD8 T cells, we could see um, really um, high levels of cytotoxic molecules, granzyme A, B, as well as perfrin. Um, so really, this patient had textbook responses, um, broad and robust immune responses, driving recovery. And whatever this patient response did is really, um, really regulated inflammation, as we found no dysregulated cytokine chemokine profiles in this patient. Um, so following the first case report, we obviously wanted to delve more into immune responses in larger cohorts. And the two main questions we asked was, what are the immune responses preceding patient's recovery? And what are the immune perturbations associated with severe disease? So to summarize, in a moderate, mild to moderate COVID-19, uh, we analyzed a total of 184 immune features. And uh, we ask the question, what are the differences in immune features between the acute and convalescent COVID-19? And as I mentioned to you before, for the, our first case report, we really validated these results and found robust and broad induction of immune responses and that included uh, antibody secreting cells, fully cardiac helper cells, CD8, CD4 cells, um, NK cells, gamma delta T cells. This, um, Activation was transient, as in convalescent um, COVID nineteen, uh, we could um, we started picking up on memory B cell and um, T cell markers. So, because we analyzed so many of those uh, immune um, features, the next question we asked was: Are any of those immune features uh, during acute time point after disease uh, onset could, could they predict the antibody levels of fluorescent uh, at convalescence? And the answer was yes. And these were the circulating T follicular helper T cell one um, cells that correlate with and can predict antibody responses and convalescence. Um, so here in the circus plot, I'm showing you statistically significant um, results and this, um, the stronger correlation, the stronger the color. And you can see the activated PD-1 positive, ICOS positive uh, follicular helper cells um, really um, correlate with and can predict um, spike IgA, IgM, IgG, the neutralizing activity and to a lesser extent RBD uh, antibody responses. And you can see um, here the same um, result represented in bubble plot. So these were the responses during um, mild to moderate COVID-19. What about immune perturbations um, associated with um, severe COVID-19? Um, to answer that question, we stratified patients um, according whether they were admitted to the hospital ward or ICU. And by doing that, what, what we found was that Patients that were in ICU, they had really high level of activation of um, immune cells across the board and the CD4, CD8, gamma delta, NK cells and different monocyte subsets. And if you look here, especially at CD4 cells, you can see that in some patients, um, close to 80 or even 90% of all the CD4 T cells in their blood were activated which numerically, they, those cells uh, do not reflect antigen-specific cells. There, there are lots of bystander activation within those um, immune cells. So again, we um, asked a question, what were the key features that were distinct between the ward and ICU patients? And as I shown you before, the main features was the highly activated um, pro cells, immune populations um, that persisted um, over the time. So um, to summarize um, what we found from immune responses in mild and severe COVID-19, 
um, in mild uh, and moderate COVID-19, we do have um, regulated cytokine responses, although there is an increase of IL-6, IL-18, MCP1, interferon gamma. We do see prototypical antiviral immune responses, and that includes monocytes, NK cells, gamma, delta, CD4, CD8, T cells, antibody secreting cells, as well as the follicular helper cells type 1 that can predict and correlate with antibody responses at convalescence. What we found in severe COVID-19 was the patients had dysregulated cytokine responses, and that led to immune hyperactivation to the point that those immune responses were detrimental, and that activation of those um, cells across the board, and in the um, center of it was IL-18 and soluble IL-6 receptor. So we know that T cells are uh, activated during COVID-19. However, um, the, the initial studies look at T cells by um, measuring activation markers, which can also um, represent by standard cells that were um, activated in a best, best bystander manner. Um, so as a next step, we really wanted to understand T cell responses uh, that get activated um, via antigen-specific manner. And to start with, um, we look at both CD4 and CD8 T cells that respond to peptides that come from the overlapping peptide pools derived from SARS-CoV-2 membrane nucleocapsid and spike. Um, and we detected um, the T cell responses by uh, cytokine, cytokines, TNF, and interferon gamma. And if you can see in contrast with COVID-19, um, unexposed uh, people, uh, COVID-19 patients had beautiful um, CD40 cells responses to uh, peptides from across different um, protein level proteins. Um, and we did see um, CD80 cell responses also, but the, the, the responses in those hospitalized patients were quite disappointing. Um, so um, we, we, we thought uh, we, we really wanted uh, to understand those CD80 cell responses in a um, greater um, level, at the greater level. So as I mentioned to you before, um, CD80 cells um, uh, recognize peptides uh, presented within MHC class one. And in humans, it is HLA-A and HLA-B. Each person has up to two different HLA-As A's and B per individual. And um, there is differential frequency of HLA alleles across ethnicity. And as I mentioned, HLA-A2 is the most do uh, dominant across the globe. So this, when we started this work, there were no epitopes. Uh, characterized ident and identified for um, COVID-19. This is why we embark on the epitope identification. And um, firstly, we look at the dominant HLA AO2. That's Jennifer Habel, a very talented PhD student in the lab, who screened um, the predicted peptides that could potentially bind to HLA AO2. Um, derived from um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and Jennifer found that a peptide nightmare derived from spike 269 was the most immunodominant across those um, peptides. So ha having known that, we could engineer specific tools called tetramers that could detect by flow cytometry um, CD T cells specific for this epitope. So tetramers are really uh, four complexes of soluble MHC class one peptide um, um, complexes. Um, and you can see with those tetramers uh, by fluorescence, we can detect uh, really nice, uh, although um, quite small uh, populations of those A2, S269 specific CD8 T cells. Um, this way, we were quite surprised how small were those responses, especially because when we look at the naive um, CD80 cells in pre-pandemic samples, there wasn't there was not much of a fault increase um, to, towards um, those responses in COVID convalescent patients. And um, especially when you compare those convalescent samples to convalescent um, memory responses 
to both influenza or EBV infection in pre-pandemic um, samples. You can see that they are quite um, small responses. And Jennifer's done lots of work looking at phenotypes and function of those cells. And our conclusion was that there is suboptimal um, subtermin sub optimal SARS-CoV-2 specific um, CDATC responses associated with this prominent um, HLA AO2 um, restricted um, C, um, epitope, um, especially, uh, especially during um, primary um, SARS-CoV-2 infection in, in our patients. But there is not it's not just bad news for CD T cell responses during um, during primary SARS-CoV-2 infection, and now we and others identified uh, more um, more um, epitopes that elicit more prominent CD T cell responses. And to date, the most immunodominant epitope is um, epitope uh, in HLA BO702 people. It is derived from nucleocapsid. And if you can see, look here um, in our essays uh, by in vitro expansion of T cell lines by ICS or tetramer staining or direct ex vivo tetramer enrichment, you can see uh, amazing um, CD T cell responses directed to those, to this um, N105 um, peptide in HLA BO702 individuals. And the um, good news is that these are really persistent CD80 responses as we measured um, longitudinally responses in up to date 270 and still see and see establishment of long long term um, COVID-9 specific um, memory CD T cells in this um, HLA BO702 individuals and they are of um, a really nice central memory um, phenotype. Um, so when we saw such um, high, um, high uh, such big populations of those um, B7 restricted N105 um, CD80 cell responses, the first thought that crossed our mind was that this are uh, uh, memory population. This is these are memory CD80 cells established by previous um, previous exposures to seasonal coronaviruses. Um, so we went to um, investigate it further. So here I'm showing you um, direct ex vivo tetramer staining by tetramer enrichment. Um, you can see really beautiful responses in COVID-19 convalescent patients, three different patients. Um, and then, then we went to compare those to um, those uh, found in the pre-pandemic samples from both adults and children uh, matched PBMCs and tonsils. And you can see that even in pre-pandemic samples, um, those tetramer populations were really stunning. So what about the phenotype? So we have looked for um, naive versus memory phenotypes. And here um, we, we look at different markers, but here I'm showing you CD27 versus CD45 array staining, whereas where um, the naive um, T cells, those in gray, sit in the upper right quadrant and the remaining populations are memory or activated um, T cells. So firstly, looking at the um, CD T cells from COVID-19 convalescent patients, you can see they, they predominantly have a really nice um, T cell memory um, phenotype. However, in uh, pre-pandemic samples, the unexpected, it was not what we expected, but the majority of those um, tetramer specific cells were actually naive. Um, so what it really meant, that these were not pre-existing memory cells, but rather uh, really large naive precursor pools. Um, so this is just show you um, um, as, um, the data as graphs across all of our donors. So um, here on the left, we're looking at um, CD80 cell responses, precursor frequency, in um, COVID-19 cases. Um, so that's our immunodominant B7 and 105 um, CD8 T cells. And you can see it's by far immunodominant as um, across um, other B7, uh, A24, 
or A24 or A2 um, restricted um, epitopes. But um, the, precursor, uh, the, the frequency of those um, CD T cell responses in COVID-19 patients really reflect naive, um, naive um, precursor frequency in pre-pandemic samples. And as you can see, um, this really high, um, high pool of naive precursors within the immunodominant B7 and 105 population. And it's a graphical representation of immunodominant hierarchies across different um, HLAs, HLA restricted epitopes. So what's the reason for such a high frequency of the B7, um, B7 restricted and 105 CD8 T cells? Um, to answer that, we look at the TCR, T cell receptor analysis to look at the clones within those particular naive and um, effector CD8 T cells. And uh, I'm not going to go in depth throughout the data, but what we found was that there was a really diverse TCR repertoire and promiscuous TCR alpha beta pairing within those B7 and 1 of five CD8 T cells. So looking at this graph, we're looking at different um, genes um, across TCR alpha chain and TCR beta chain. And usually what we find within the um, CD8 T cell pool specific for um, a particular epitope is that the alpha beta pairing or um, at least one of the segments, it's really biased towards one or two um, segments, but what you can see here, really promiscuous pairing um, across alpha and beta chains, which underlie, uh, which means that it's really easy to generate TCRs that can recognize that B7 and 105 epitope. So in summary, um, B7 and 105 cells are the most immunodominant SARS-CoV-2 T cell population known to date. And that's because of the high naive precursor frequency and TCR alpha beta diversity within those immunodominant B7 and 105 CD8 T cells. And our study provides um, insights into SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell origins and subsequent responses. So that's epitope specific CD8 T cell responses towards um, um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. What about T cell responses towards COVID-19 vaccines? So us and other groups have shown that um, current um, vaccines, the mRNA Pfizer vaccine and AstraZeneca vaccine can elicit robust both CD4 and CD8 T cell responses following COVID vaccination. And what I'm showing you here, um, the um, AIM assay that looks at the activation markers after stimulation with overlapping um, peptides within um, the spike. So um, as you can see, comparing to the DMSO control or spike, spike um, overlap, pep, um, PBMC cultures with uh, peptides uh, overlapping um, for the spike um, from pre-vaccination uh, and comparing to the DMSO control uh, around 30 days after um, those two of the vaccine, uh, you can see that um, PBMC's culture, CD4 and CD T cells cultures, cultures with the spike peptides um, can um, get um, greatly activated, um, suggesting that these are um, spike-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells elicited after the second dose of um, vaccination. Um, we've also done tetramer uh, staining uh, for the epitopes that are uh, within the spike. And here um, I'm showing the HLA-0201 uh, spike 269 um, tetramer staining. And we're looking at T1 pre-dose 1 um, here is pre-dose two and one month post-dose two. And you can really see a nice gradual increase um, in those tetramer specific CD8 T cells elicited after um, a mRNA vaccine, um, especially one month after um, the second dose of um, mRNA vaccine, you can see really stunning tetramer specific CD8 T cell responses that are of a really nice um, T central memory phenotype. 
and that's obviously really exciting as I, I've shown you previously that uh, vaccines such as uh, influenza inactivated vaccines cannot elicit um, CD80 cell responses. So in summary, what I've shown you today is um, that both influenza infection and vaccination can induce antibodies, antibody secreting cells, tifoleca helper cells, but only influenza virus infection can induce CD8 T cells. Influenza specific CD8 T cells can provide broad cross-reactive immunity and recognize um, in influenza A, B, and C uh, viruses um, capable of infecting humans. We found robust and broad immune responses that precede COVID-19 re recovery in mild to moderate cases. Um, severe COVID-19 was associated with overactivation of immune responses, as well as dysregulation of inflammation. Um, B7 and 105 CD80 cell responses to date are the most immune dominant um, CD80 cell responses found in COVID-19. Um, and both SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination can induce potent CD4 and CD8 cell responses, which is really exciting as these are the cells that can provide broadly cross-reactive immune responses. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in my lab uh, for all the amazing and hard work. We, we've had um, many collaborators over the last year, both within the Dorothy Institute, as well as um, globally. Um, I, I'd like to acknowledge our funding um, and thank you again for your attention. It was my pleasure um, to join in this meeting. Thank you.